have to apologize for the delay and uh, some trouble on the way over. But inshallah, in the little time that we have remaining, we'll try and cover as much as we can. And whatever is left over, we'll cover tomorrow. Yesterday after the Majlis, I was thinking about the topic we had chosen, the topic that I was looking at, our psychological or emotional well-being. And I looked at the audience we had. A lot of you are very young. A lot of you haven't started going through a lot of the difficulties that we'll be talking about. You haven't started struggling with a lot of the things that we'll be talking about. So I thought maybe it would be best to change what we're talking about. But then I looked at the statistics that we looked at again. I looked at those things that we mentioned yesterday. The struggles of children aged 10 to 19 was one of the, was one of the statistics. And the other statistic was of young people aged from five to 16. And I thought, the way that Islam deals with the issues that we're talking about, it doesn't necessarily say that if your mind is ill, then you do this and you'll be cured. No. Islam tells us in life, do these things and you'll avoid these issues altogether. Or if you've fallen into these issues, do these things and those things, they will get better. But Islam doesn't tell us, do this thing for this issue. It does not tell us that do this thing for this problem. This is the answer to that issue that you have. No. Islam just tells us how to live our life. And if we keep going on that way of life, then <coughs> inshallah we will not fall into these issues. And if we do, then that way of life itself will pull us back out of those issues, even if we do fall into them. So when we look at the things that we're going to talk about, there are things about the way of life that Islam tells us to take upon, take upon ourselves. So I decided we will carry on with what we're talking about. We'll carry on with these same issues. And one of the things that's asked a lot, and it relates to what we just said, one of the things that's asked a lot when it comes to our psychological well-being, whether our mind is healthy, whether we're thinking the way we should be thinking, one of the questions that's asked a lot, or rather it's often not said as a question, it's often said as a criticism, a lot of people say that Muslims can't suffer from these issues. A lot of people say that Muslims, they can't struggle with these kinds of things. But our lives are the same as the lives of those people who aren't Muslims. Sure, there's things that we do that other people don't. There's things that other people don't do that we do. But at the end of the day, our lives are the same. We still go to work. We still deal with the same deadlines. We still deal with colleagues. We still go to school, we still have to make friends, we still have to get our homework done on time, our coursework done on time, the stress of exams. We still do all the same things other people do. We still go home, put on Netflix, watch TV. We still play football, enjoy football. We do all the same things as everybody else does. So why would the things that affect other people not affect us? If we struggle from these kind of issues, if our mind becomes unhealthy, the way we're thinking starts to become destructive, starts to become problematic for us. It doesn't mean that I'm not a good Muslim. It doesn't mean that I'm not a good person. It doesn't mean that my Iman is low. It simply means I need to carry on doing what Islam tells me to do and let Islam take care of me. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of me. We said yesterday that Allah azza wa jal, although the Quran and Dua is powerful, Quran and Dua alone will not take us out of our problems. And we use the example that if I don't revise, I can ask Allah all I want for help in my exams. But if I don't revise, then why would Allah Azza wa Jal help me? But it goes the other way as well. If I do that which Allah is telling me to do, if I do the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me to do, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help me himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will himself step forward and help me. And there's a small example about our closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us. And it's the example of a small baby, a toddler, can't walk yet, can't move. Now the Ayah Medin who gave this, he says, he was walking through his house one day and he saw his granddaughter just lying on the bed. He walked through his house, went to a little library that he has in the back of his house. He got the book he needed and as he was walking back to where he was sitting, he saw his granddaughter raise her arms up. She was kind of calling to him to pick him up. His granddaughter obviously couldn't walk. She's a baby. She couldn't get up and go to him. But what did she do? She reached her arms up. He saw this and then he went over and picked her up. 
Now the example here. We cannot go all the way to Allah Azza But all we need to do is reach our arms out. All we need to do is take that first step and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will help us the rest of the way. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will come closer and closer to us and bring us towards Him. Bring us towards health, bring us towards goodness. We only need to take those first few steps. Do those little things that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has told us to do. And the likelihood is the majority of us already do it. And the one thing we'll focus on today and try and get through as much of it as we can in the time that's remaining. Inshallah, we'll be done by 9.30, we'll finish on time. The one thing we'll focus on today is taking care of the people around us. Something that Islam puts so much importance towards, gives so much stress towards, taking care of those around you. And it's something we do anyway. It's something we like to do anyway. At least we like to think we do. But let's just look at how we take care of people around us. What do we do to take care of the people around us? Now we said this is an instruction from Islam to take care of people around us. We said this is Islam's way of taking care of us by telling us how to live our life so that we can avoid or come out of these issues and these struggles that we face. So where does Islam tell us to take care of people? Where does Islam tell us to take care of those around you? One of the most beautiful examples is that of the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It starts with Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain alayhi wa sallam who were ill. They weren't feeling well, so Rasulullah says to Imam Ali alayhi sallam, he says to him, make a promise to Allah azza wa jal. Make a promise to Allah that, oh Allah, if my two sons get better, if they become healthy again, then I will fast for three days. Just like a trade with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at the beauty of this trade. If Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain get better, Imam Ali is saying he will fast for three days. And when Imam Ali fasts for three days, who is that benefiting? Does it help Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there anything that we can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. What do we have that Allah doesn't? There's nothing that we can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this trade with Allah, what it, is, what it essentially is doing, if we look at fasting in the month of Ramadan, when we fast, who does it benefit? It benefits us, ourselves. So this trade, Imam Ali is saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, if you do this for me, then I will complete an action that will help myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more than anything, he wants what is best for us. And remember that point, because we'll come back to it later. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants what is best for us. So in this trade, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do something for us, and in exchange, we will also do something that in the end benefits us. We will do something that is good for us. So in both ways, we are the ones benefiting. And this is the kind of promise we make to Allah. It's the kind of trade we do. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he agrees to make this oath, this promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with him, his family do as well. Bibi Fatima, salamu alayhi alayha, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain alayhi wa salam, and Bibi Firza, salamu alayhi alayha, also, takes part in this. So they're going to fast for three days. Imam Hassan and Hussein, they are now better, and the time has come for them to fast these three days. The first night they, well, the first day they fast. The night comes and they sit down together for iftar. They sit down together for, for iftar when they hear a knock at the door. When they hear this knock at the door, Imam Ali goes to open the door to see who is there. He goes and he sees a poor man, a needy man. The man says to Imam Ali, no, Ali, I'm hungry, I have no food. So willingly, each and every person who had fasted, they give up their food and give it to the hungry man. Now I asked myself when I saw this, why did all of them give their food? If everybody gave just a little bit, surely that would have been enough. And this is one of the most painful things that we see about the life of the Ahlul Bayt. They ate so little. They had so little for themselves that when they all gave their food together, it was enough to feed that one man properly. They all gave their food, and that night they had iftar purely for water. They opened their fast purely with water, and had nothing to do sahri with. They had nothing with which to eat before they start their next fast. The second day came, iftar time has come. It's now been 36 hours where they haven't eaten, give or take. The first day, the first night, and the second day. Now they sit down for iftar and again, there's a knock at the door. Now Ali goes and who does he see? There's an orphan at the door. The orphan says, Ya Ali, 
I have no food, I am hungry. Again, the family all give up their food for this young orphan. This happens again on the third day where they sit down for iftar and they hear a knock at the door. They hear this knock at the door, they go to open the door. Imam Ali opens the door and who does he see? A prisoner, a captive. And again, they give their food to the captive who had nothing for himself. He was hungry, he did not have food, they give their food to him. The fourth day comes. Imam Ali takes Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein to see their grandfather Rasulullah. When Rasulullah sees the two boys, he becomes worried, he can see they do not have energy, they have not eaten, they are hungry. He asks Imam Ali and Imam Ali tells him the story. Now there's two different narrations regarding this. One says that at that very moment, Jibra'il comes down and one says that Rasulullah first goes to, to the house of Sayyidah Zahra and over there Jibra'il comes down with an ayah from Allah Azza wa And this is the ayah of the Quran of Surah Dahr known as Ayah al Atar. And again, the narrations differ. Some say there were up to 18 ayahs, ayahs revealed at this moment. These are known as the ayahs of, ayahs of hal Adha, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran talks about the family of Rasulullah. And of those ayahs, this event of the three days of fasting is directly referenced in Surah Dahar, ayah 8, where Allah azza wa jal says, and they gave food out of love for him, and out of love for Allah, to the poor person, the orphan, and the captive. So this in the Quran is where we see that out of love for Allah Azza wa Jal, if you care for Allah Azza wa Jal, then you will give for others. You will take care of others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, he references the Ahlul Bayt here, so if anybody ever asks you the importance of the Ahlul Bayt, tell them to look at Ayah hal Tell them to look at Surah Dahab. It's also known as Surah Insan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us here the importance of taking care of others. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also <laughs> in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 75. It's narrated that Rasulullah once said that every single Muslim must give charity every single day. His companions asked him, Ya Rasulullah, not everybody is capable of giving charity every day. Not everybody has those, that kind of money. Not everybody has that kind of wealth that they can give charity every day. <coughs> Rasulullah then replies to them by saying, charity can be so much as moving an obstacle from the road. For instance, if there's a piece of smashed glass on the road, to sweep it to the side. Rasulullah says, charity can be the smile you give towards another person. Rasulullah says, charity can be the replying of salam. When somebody says salam to you, to reply to them. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To reply to their salam. This can be a charity. Now we have to ask ourselves here, because a lot of people say, or they, they, they neglect the fact that Islam does take care of us psychologically. Islam does take care of how we're feeling, what we're thinking. And here again in this hadith, we can see that Islam does care. Because if you say salam to me, and I say salam back to you, what did you get? What did you get from that? Did you get money? No. Did you get a car? No. House? No. Job? No. Food? No. What did you get? How is it charity? Charity is when I give something, when you gain something. What did I get by receiving a response to my salam? Now you see, when somebody says salam to somebody, they're not giving them anything materialistic. They're not giving them any money. They're not giving them anything physical. What they are doing though, is responding to somebody's friendship. Responding to somebody's kindness. For instance, it's a very easy example. If I go to say salam to somebody, if I go to say salam to somebody, go to shake their hands, and they ignore me. They don't shake my hand. For me, I've been rejected. I've been ignored. If my friends around me see that, I know they're gonna laugh. What has happened here, other than somebody not replying to my handshake? Somebody's not given that handshake back. In the same way, when we say salam, and somebody responds to that salam, they're accepting our salam. They're accepting the dua of peace. And all that will do for me is help me with my feelings. It will make me feel better. And at least if it doesn't make me feel better when somebody says salam, at least when somebody does not say salam, I will not, I will not feel bad. 
if they say salam. Why? Because when somebody does not say salam, does not respond to your salam, we feel bad. And how do we know this? I'm not going into Messiah, we still have time. But it's a story of Mawla Ali. When Sayyidina Zahra comes to him and says, Ali, I know the pain you are going through, that the people in the town do not even say salam to you. At this point, when Mawla Ali starts to cry and looks at Sayyidina Zahra, what does he say? He says, no Zahra, it's not that they do not say salam to me. When I say salam, people do not reply. If it hurts Mawla Ali that people do not respond to his salam, Mawla Ali, who was so strong, both physically, both emotionally, of course it will hurt us. Of course it can hurt us. Rasulullah says that this is charity. So we see here, Islam, it really does take care of how we feel. This form of charity is taking care of how somebody else feels. To smile at my brother, to make him feel like he has a brother within me. I'm not giving him any money, I'm not giving him any phys anything physical. But I'm giving him that feeling of safety within me. I'm giving him that feeling of happiness from seeing my smile. So we see that Islam does great, give a great importance to our psychological well-being, our emotional well-being. And we see that it does tell us, it does instruct us, take care of other people. It does tell us to make sure we're taking care of others. But who? There's a lot of people around us. Who do I have to take care of? Who do I need to take care of? After Allah Azzawajal, or in fact in terms of people, after Rasulullah, the Ahlul Bayt and the Imams, who is most important? In our lives, who matters the most? Our parents, in particular our mother. Why? They are our first teachers. They are the people who take care of us unconditionally. And as I mentioned this, I mentioned a small side point as well. Somebody asked me. They asked, why does Islam give so much importance to taking care of your parents? Why does it not give that much importance or say so much about taking care of your children? It's a small, small, small side, point to, side point to be noted. It's a small side point to be noted. Why does Islam say so much about taking care of our parents and not as much about taking care of our children? Why does it not tell our parents all the time, take care of your children, take care of your children? But for us, it always tells us, take care of your parents. It tells us how important your parents are. Now you see, when your parents love you, they love you forever. That love doesn't change. <coughs> love might grow, but the level of love that your parents have for you will not drop. Even if your parent doesn't tell you, they'll always be worried about you. They'll always be thinking, is he okay? Is there anything that's worrying you? Is there anything that's hurting you? When your parents are going through the most difficult times of their life, their biggest worry is still their children. But see, with children, with us, especially as we grow older, as we become more independent, when we start to need our parents less and less, our love for our parents, it might not fade, but we might forget the importance of our parents. We might forget to show that love to our parents. So Islam gives more importance where it's needed. Islam gives more importance to us taking care of our parents because the parents will take care of their children, but sometimes we can forget to look out for our parents. Sometimes we, forget, we can forget to take care of them. Our parents are some of the most important people we have to take care of. And often they won't tell us what they're struggling with. Often when our parents are going through difficult times, they won't ever let me and you know. Why? Because they don't want us to be worried about the things that they're worrying about. So we have to take it on ourselves to take care of them. A smile. Ask your parents how they're doing. Sit with your parents, talk to them. For a parent, when they're around their children, their heart can feel at ease. So take time to be with your parents, to be with those who take care of you. Our parents are first and foremost the people we must take care of. Second, our siblings, our brothers and our sisters. Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, Imam Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam. He tells us about three things about the relationship that we should have with our siblings, with our brothers. He writes of your brother. The very first one you for your brother, you should be like a support. 
You should make your brother stronger. This is the first thing. The second, you should defend your brother against his enemies. You should defend your brother. And the third thing, for your brother is that you should bring him towards the religion, bring him towards things which are good. If I see my brother doing something which isn't right, it's very easy to let it go. It's very easy for me to think, I'll let him do what he's doing. This is the third right that we often forget. If my brother needs my help, of course I'll support him. I'll make him stronger. If I see something, somebody saying something bad against my brother, of course I'm going to defend my brother. But often we forget that when we see our brother doing something wrong, when we see our siblings doing something wrong, we have to remind them. We have to bring them towards that which is right, that which is good. These are the rights of the brother. And then your friends. And in these coming few days, we're going to focus a lot on our friends, because our friends are really important. And Islam puts a lot of emphasis on your friends. We don't always talk about the emphasis that Islam gives to our friends, but it's there, and it's very strong. Why? Let's look at the topic we're talking about. Going through you know, psychological and emotional distress, when there's things stressing us and worrying us. We should be able to talk to our parents, but we can't always. We should be able to turn to our parents or our siblings, but sometimes we can't tell them. Sometimes we don't feel that comfortable opening up to them, telling them about what's worrying us, what's stressing us. Sometimes we don't want to tell them for different reasons our friends. Our friends are people who we can turn to. Our friends are people who often we feel more comfortable talking to. Often our friends know about the things we get up to that our parents don't. The things you can't tell your parents you did. All the stories, like we spoke about yesterday, the stories of us wrestling in Al-Qaeda and play fighting, things like that. We didn't tell our parents we were doing that. We didn't tell our parents we would go and wrestle and play fight and do things like that. When I got into trouble at school, I didn't go and tell my parents, but my friends knew about it. There's a lot of things our friends know about us that our parents don't. There's a lot of things that we can't say to our parents for whichever reason. We should be able to. And if you can, then it's good. But remember your friends as well. Because often we feel happier looking towards our friends. Often we feel more comfortable talking to our friends. So make sure the friends you have around you are good friends, are true friends. And we'll speak more about that in depth in the coming days. But then, the rights of your friend. Who your friend is. How you take care of your friend. These are some of the very important things in Islam. These are, the, some of the, these are some of the things that we have to really take care of in Islam. Because our friends should be there for us the same way we should be there for them. It's narrated, I believe, by Imam Jaf Salih alayhi salam. <laughs> In hell, the people will cry out, I had nobody to look out for me, nor did I have any true friends. We're also told by Imam Ali السلام, to have as many good friends, as many true friends as possible. And this is a hadith of Imam Ali. He tells us, have as many true friends as possible, for they are your suppliers in joy and your support in, your shelter in, distress and despair. What does this mean? Now, Ali is telling us, have as many true friends as you can, because they're your suppliers in joy. What does that mean? It means, and it tells us something about friendship as well. Because when your friend is happy, when something good happens to your friend, you should be happy as well. They're your suppliers in joy. Your friends will bring you happiness, and they'll be your shelter in distress. When you're going through something difficult, you can turn to your friends. They'll be your support. They'll take care of you. They'll shield you from whatever struggle you're struggling with. This is the importance of friends. And Islam also tells us to take care of our community. It's an ayah in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, inna wa mu'minuna ikhwa. Verily the believers are brothers. And so we have to take care of our community, our people, the people around us, as though they are our brothers. And alhamdulillah, here in our time, like I said yesterday, from all those years ago to now, this community is growing bigger and stronger. And it's growing bigger and stronger still. But we have to take advantage of that community. We have to be able to help those around us within our community. And just bearing an eye on time. We'll continue the rest of this tomorrow, inshallah. And move towards Masai. Because you see, when we look to taking care of other people, 
often we can find ourselves in a place where we put others before ourselves, which is good, which is important, we should. And Islamically, we are told the instruction on giving charity is that you give charity until the point where the benefit of what the person is getting is no longer greater than what you are losing. Of course, we don't say we lose anything when we give charity, but we're told, well, what does that mean? Let me just explain that a little bit. When I give something, if the person who received what I have given is getting something that is getting something little, but it costs me a lot to give it. It's very difficult for me to give it. We're told that at that point, we can consider not giving that charity. We can consider not giving that, because the benefit is not as much as the difficulty to me. But when a mother hears about a difficulty to her child, a mother hears about a difficulty, who would she think of first? She thinks of her children. When a wife hears of difficulty, she thinks of her husband. But when Sayyidah Zainab is told that Imam Hussein has been summoned to the palace of the tyrants, her first thought is for her brother. She says to Imam Hussein, Hussein, she says to her brother, go but take with you some young men so that if, if this is a plot, if somebody tries to hurt you when you go to the palace, there are people there to defend you. There are people there to take care of you. According to some narrations, three young men went there with Imam Hussein. According to some, they were up to 18. All we know for sure is that amongst them was Abu Fadl Abbas. Imam Hussein goes with the men. They arrive at the door of the palace, the gate of the palace. Imam Hussein turns around to the people with him and he says to them, you stop here. Wait here. But Abbas, he never disobeyed Imam Hussein. Never once did he question Imam Hussein. But here he does say, Mawla, we have come. We have come to take care of you if anything should happen. How can we take care of you from outside? Mawla Hussein says, look, if you hear me raise my voice, then you have my permission to come inside the palace. Until such time, stay outside. Mawla Hussein enters the palace. <coughs> He is told to give bayah, to give allegiance. At this point, he says those famous words, Miss Li La Yubayo, Miss Lahu. A man like me will not give bayah to a man like Yazid. What do we see here? We find here that not just then, but throughout all of time, there will be men like Hussein, and there will be men like Yazid. Imam Hussein says this, and a conversation ensues. The result of that conversation is that he's agreed Imam Hussein salam, will be asked at namaz the next day. Imam Hussein salam, will be asked this question of allegiance. There he will give his response in front of the people. Imam Hussein salam, turns to leave the palace. Marwan Lanatullahi alayhi is standing there. He's standing there and he says, if you do not take allegiance from Hussein right now, understand you will never get the allegiance of Hussein. Say to Hussein, if he does not give allegiance right now, we will cut off his head. This is Hussein, the son of Haider al They have tried to threaten the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Mullah Hussein turns around. He looks Marwan in the eyes and he raises his voice. He says, Marwan, you think you can threaten me, the son of Haider? And that too with the threat of life. That too by saying you will take my life? Wallah. This is not a worry for me, this is not a threat for me. But remember, Mawla Hussein has raised his voice. Outside, Abu Fadl Abbas hears Mawla Hussein raise his voice. He comes rushing in, he sees Marwan standing there, he sees the soldiers there armed. Mawla Abbas takes his sword out of his sheath. Imam Hussein looks at Abbas and says, Abbas, no, the time for war is not here. It is not time right now for you to raise your sword. Ya Allah. Look at the patience of Abu Fadl Abbas. He takes his sword immediately, puts it back in his sheath. Hazrat Abbas was born. Why? He was born to protect Mawla Hussein. But every time Abbas takes his sword out to protect his master, Hussein tells him, Abbas, put your sword away. Abbas, put your sword away. Right now is not the time for you to use your sword. Hazrat Abbas puts his sword away. Imam Hussein returns to his house. Sayyid Zainab is there waiting for him. He says to her, Zainab, now Medina is no longer a place for us to stay. 
now Medina is no longer safe for us. Hussein must leave Medina. Sayyidah Zainab says, if Hussein goes, Zainab cannot live without Hussein. I will come with you. Mawla Hussein says, go to your house. Go and ask your husband for permission. If your husband grants you permission, then you may come with me. <coughs> Sayyidah Zainab goes to her house. At the same time, Mawla Hussein goes to the grave of Rasulullah. Sayyidah Zainab goes to her house. She asks permission from her husband. She does not need to ask permission. She does not need to ask. Why? Because when Sayyidah Zainab was getting married, Mawla Ali remembered this very moment. There is a condition in the nikah of Sayyidah Zainab. There's a condition in the marriage of Sayyidah Zainab that if ever Mawla Hussein is going on travels, is going to leave his homeland, leave Medina, Sayyidah Zainab has permission to go with him. Husband Abdullah and Ja'far Tayyar will not stop her. But still Sayyidah Zainab goes and asks for permission. Initially, Sayyidah Zainab, she bids farewell to Anna Muhammad. She says goodbye to her two sons. She says goodbye to her husband. Sayyidah Zainab then returns to the house of Imam Hussein. We said Imam Hussein salam, went to the grave of Rasulullah. He goes, he sits down next to the grave of Rasulullah and he starts remembering his childhood in Medina. He starts remembering all the things he has seen in Medina. He remembers the beauty of Medina, how he used to run and he used to play. How Jibreel would come to play with him, how the angels would come to play with him. He remembers how he loved Medina the city of his grandfather. He says to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, now I must go on my journey away from Medina. He begins to cry and he begins to weep. It is narrated that Imam Hussein cries and he weeps so much he falls unconscious. When he falls unconscious, he sees a dream. In this dream, he sees Rasulullah. Rasulullah's Imam is on the floor. His top button is unbuttoned. They say Rasulullah is in a state of grief. He's, a state, he's in a state of despair. Mawla Hussain sees his grandfather and he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, what has happened? What is this state? Why are you so upset? Rasulullah looks at Mawla Hussain and he says, Hussain, me and you both know now when you leave Medina, you will not return. When you leave Medina, you will go with the women and children. You will go with the men. Hussain, we know what state you will return in. Mawla Hussain sits beside Rasulullah in this dream. It is narrated, they cry and they weep for a while. After a while, Rasulullah stands up and he says, Hussein, enough. The time has come for you to begin your journey. The time has come for you to leave Medina. Mawla Hussein comes back into consciousness, as it said. He then goes towards where all the horses and camels have been prepared. The women and children all come out to the horses. They come out to the camels. One by one, everybody gets ready. All the women and children are boarded, are mounted on top of the camels. All the women and children are set up until the point where Bibi Fatima Sohra steps forward to mount a camel. Mawla Hussein looks at his daughter and says, Sohra, no. Sohra, you will stay in Medina. Bibi Fatima Sohra begins crying. She begins weeping. She asks her father, why must I stay when everybody leaves? She says, I will not be any trouble. I will not cause any issues. Let me come with you. Mawla Hussein says, no, Sohra, your place is in Medina. She says, then at least let me say farewell to everybody one more time. Let me say khuda hafiz to everybody who is leaving me. One by one, the women step forward. One by one, the children step forward. And then the only people left is the family of Bibi Fatima Sohra. Hazrat Ali Akbar steps forward to say goodbye. This brother and this sister, they were very close. Hazrat Ali Akbar and Bibi Fatima Sohra were very close. She says to Hazrat Ali Akbar, Akbar, promise me when you go on your journey, you will not forget me. Hazrat Ali Akbar says, I promise I will not forget you. I promise you I will return. So he makes this promise. And wallah, Hazrat Ali Akbar did not forget his promise to Sogra. It is narrated that on the day of Ashura, when Hazrat Ali Akbar is about to leave the tent to go towards the battlefield, he is speaking to Imam Zain al Abidin. He's bidding farewell to his brother and he says to Imam Zain al-Abidin, tell Sughra I did not forget. <laughs> tell Sughra I wanted to come back and fulfill my promise, but what could I do? Hussein was alone in the battlefield. <laughs> tell Sughra I did not forget. As Ali Akbar does not forget his promise. One by one, the Fatima Sughra bids farewell, farewell to her family. She then takes baby Ali Asghar in her arms. 
Hasan Ali Asghar takes his small little hands and clings around the neck of Bibi Fuad <laughs> Masulra. She holds him for a while. And then Mawla Hussein says to one of the young children, he says, go and tell Suhra that we must leave now. Tell her to give Asghar back to be Umar al so that we may make our journey. Bibi Fatima Suhra takes Asghar, pushes him towards Bibi Umar al but baby Asghar tightens his grip around the neck of Bibi Fatima Suhra. Hazrat Ali Asghar will not leave. Then Bibi Farwa steps forward to take Asghar. Hazrat Ali Asghar will not leave. The women and children, one by one, all step forward to the point where Sayyidah Zainab steps forward. Asghar will not leave. Little Sakina steps forward. Asghar will not go into her arms. Then comes a time where Mawla Hussein himself comes forward to Bibi Fatima Suhra. Hazrat Ali Asghar is still gripping the neck of Bibi Fatima Suhra. Mawla Hussein whispers something small into the ear of Hazrat Ali Asghar. As Ali Asghar begins to laugh and he leans towards Mawla Hussein. Mawla Hussein takes him. I do not know what Imam Hussein said, but I must think it must be the same thing that on the day of Ashura, when there is nobody left for Hussein but little baby Ali Asghar. When Mawla Hussein whispers something in Asghar's ear to stop him to stop him from crying, it must be the same thing he says in Medina. Mawla Hussein takes Hazrat Ali Asghar. He hands him over to Bibi Umar Rubal. Bibi Umar Rubal mounts the camel now. All the women and children have mounted their camels. The men are waiting because there is one woman left. Sayyid Zainab is left to mount her camel. First, Hazrat Abbas steps forward and puts his knee out so Sayyid Zainab may step on his knee. Then on the other side, Hazrat Ali Akbar steps forward, puts his knee out so Sayyid Zainab may step on his knee. Then from behind, Mawla Hussein gives Bibi Zainab a hand so that means she may climb the camel. But Aisha, <laughs> Abbas, Akbar, Ya Hussein, where were you, Isha? Where Zainab had no one to take her onto the camel. Where Zainab had no one to help her. <laughs> one last time on Masai. At this point, Bibi Zainab mounts the camel. The men mount their camels. They begin their journey. At the front of the caravan is Imam Hussein, but in front of him is Hazrat Abbas. Hazrat Abbas has cleared the streets of Medina. It has been announced, no man shall leave his house today. Why? The daughter of Ali is going to be in the streets of Medina. The daughter of Ali is beginning her travels, but Abbas, where were you in Shah? Abbas, where were you in Kufa when they say Yadah Zainab was in the middle of the palace? When she was standing in the palace and Yazid stood there. When Yazid stood there and not a single person looked towards any other direction other than Sayyid Zainab. When the eyes of the Mal'oon looked towards the daughter of Ali. Abbas, where were you then? Abbas, where were you to save Zainab then? Allah la'natullahi ala qawmi al-zalimeen. Fasaya'alamun ladina zalamu ayyum unqadirin yanqadirun. Before we head upstairs take part in Nazarbayev. We will ask that the brothers remain seated for five minutes while the sisters make their way, and then inshallah we will take our, make our way upstairs. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.